But a black hole has opened up in the government's finances. This year, the British government is expected to have the biggest deficit among all advanced economies. It's going to borrow £160 billion, pounds, one of every pounds, four pounds it spends. And yes, some of that deficit will shrink as the economy recovers, but the new government is still going to have to raise taxes and cut spending a lot in order to reduce its benefit borrowing. And until then, Britain's debt is going to carry on soaring. Now, fortunately, it was quite low before the crisis started, but it's set to reach around 90% of GDP uh, within two years. Now, if you see Greece there at the top, we're nowhere near Greece. But then neither is Portugal, nor Spain, and panic has been spreading there. And the thing about panic is that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If investors lose confidence in the government's economic management for whatever reason, good or bad, we could, we could witness a run on the pound and UK government bonds. And that new 750 billion euro uh, stabilisation fund that EU leaders uh, agreed yesterday will only protect euro members not Britain. Now whatever happens, Britain and other European economies face difficult years ahead. The three immediate priorities are fixing the banking system, cutting the deficit, and encouraging healthier and more balanced future <coughs> growth. Longer term, we need to adjust to the rise of China and other emerging economies, and we need to cope with climate change. Now let's start with the banks. At the moment, these banks that we bailed out can borrow vast sums for almost nothing from the Bank of England and other central banks. But instead of lending that on to small businesses that desperately need credit, and the new ones which will create the new jobs and growth of the future, they're making easy profits by buying government bonds or more speculative assets, safe in the knowledge that governments will bail them out if they go wrong, as they just have in Greece. So this flood of easy money it pumps up asset prices, but does little to benefit the rest of the economy. It isn't even doing much to recapitalise the banks, because they're paying out most of their easy profits on dividends to shareholders and undeserved bonuses to unrepentant bankers. So in these exceptional times, when the government has a controlling stake in Northern Rock, in RBS and in Lloyds, it should direct them to lend more <coughs> to sound borrowers. And it should also ban all banks, all of which have benefited from government guarantees, from paying out bonuses and dividends until they have enough cash reserves and enough capital to provide an adequate cushion against future losses. And together, G20 governments need to implement radical financial reforms. Now, while the banks were on their knees, a golden opportunity was missed to break finance's stranglehold over the economy. And now, this monstrous state-sponsored kleptocracy is back, it's bigger and worse than ever, and its grip will be much harder to break. But this crony, crony capitalism must be dismantled. It is absolutely unacceptable that some banks deemed too big to fail can gamble at public expense. Heads they win, tails taxpayers lose. Capitalism without risk of failure is like power without accountability. It corrupts absolutely. Now for a start, we need better regulation. Banks must be compelled to hold a much larger buffer of capital that rises in boom times to limit excessive risk taking. And once that is in place, bankers' bonuses should be paid in shares that cannot be sold for a long time, so they lose out if their bets go wrong. And to avoid future bailouts, banks must be restructured so they can be wound up quickly and easily if need be. Now all of that is essential, but the problem is bigger than that, because even in good times, big banks are far too powerful. Government-backed, riddled with conflicts of interest, they abuse their privileged position as gatekeepers of capital markets. Now they say, look, we make huge profits, that's a contribution to society. No, it isn't. Their monopolistic profits, profits are a cost to society. And since even the best regulation is not fail-safe, in the event of a crisis, politicians would still come under huge pressure to bail them out. 
So to increase competition, to curb banks' power, and to ensure that they are allowed to fail, they must be broken up. This crisis has caused the worst recession in living memory, mass unemployment, an alarming rise in government debt. The next one could threaten government solvency, the open world economy, even liberal democracy. In 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt faced down J.P. Morgan and broke up that giant bank. Today's leaders should follow his example. Now the second priority is fixing the deficit. While demand remains depressed, it would be premature to make cuts. The danger, though, is that markets are going to force government's hands. <coughs> Sooner rather than later, then, Britain and other European economies are going to have to raise taxes and cut spending. But the measures have to be fair, and they have to do as little damage as possible to the rest of the economy. Otherwise, we could have riots in the streets, like Greece, or we could throttle the recovery. So public spending cuts should spur the vulnerable. Cutting investment in infrastructure and in lifelong learning is a false economy. And to prevent house prices soaring and the long waiting list for social housing growing in any further, we urgently need to build more homes. And the wisest way to cut the deficit is to accelerate desirable reforms, encourage people to retire later. As we live longer, we must work longer and save more if we're going to enjoy a comfortable retirement. And it's only fair that baby boomers should bear some of the burden of adjustment. Tax harmful things, like carbon emissions. And if you raise the tax as emissions fall, that gives you a steady stream of revenue and it stimulates clean tech industries and the job, green jobs of the future. If the G20 can agree on it, a global tax on financial transactions could also raise lots of cash. After all, people pay stamp duty when they buy shares. So why shouldn't larger financial transactions also be taxed? A bold government might also legalise drugs and tax them as it does alcohol and nicotine. But the most important reform is to make the tax system fairer and less harmful to jobs and growth by cutting tax on labour and increasing, in, introducing a tax on land values. Now, a land tax could raise huge sums, it could, and it could also stabilise the economy by limiting property speculation. And it would also boost economic growth, because when you tax work, it costs jobs, and it causes people to put in less effort. But land is in fixed supply, and it can't be spirited away to a tax haven. Above all, a land tax would be fair. It's astonishing, land in Britain is more unequally distributed than in Brazil. There, 1% of the population owns 49% of the land. Here, 0.3% of the population owns 69% of Britain. Britain's biggest landowner, the Duke of Buccleuch, owns 277,000 acres because he descends from a man who sees vast swathes of Scotland. And instead of being taxed, he gets huge handouts from Europe's common agricultural policy. In Spain, the Duchess of Alba owns two and a half million acres. And the crucial thing is, that land goes up in value each year, not because of landowners' hard work, but because of that of others. As talented and hard-working people like you have flocked to London, the value of the 300 acres of fields now Mayfair and Bel Belgravia, passed down to successive Dukes of Westminster, has skyrocketed to an estimated six and a half billion pounds. Now surely you should be taxing that windfall gain rather than the work of those who generated it. And since infrastructure investment raises surrounding land values, a land tax could help pay for new tube lines, for Crossrail, for the high-speed rail network that Britain so desperately needs. It's high time that we face down the ultimate vested interest, the monopolists who still own most of Britain. <coughs>